Welcome back to everyone. I was, I had the privilege of bouncing around a handful of rooms and I think most people got through all the questions. So good for you. Thanks for being so open and willing to share. The, the rooms I listened in on definitely had a variety of people that were newer in their new job or newer into the field in general, and then people uh, who've been around for a long time. So we are going to do a share back. And I think I did A through E yesterday. So this is your challenge to remember the name, the letter of the group that you were with. Because the name got all scrambled, I think. So let's start with um, group F. Who was with group F? Anybody want to admit that? Uh, Jamie and I were facilitating that meeting. Is that you, Erica? Yeah. Great. All right. Well, I'm going to open my little notes page. But again, the, the function of the share back, and we'll go five groups just like we did yesterday. You're lucky you get to go first because after this, everyone will say, well, like Erica said, blah, blah, blah. But share just some of your salient points across the three questions. It can be brief and then we'll build upon that for the next groups that go. So G will be up next. So whoever that is, be prepared to go after Erica. Okay, go ahead, Erica. I might have Jamie chime in if I miss anything. Of so. course, and anyone else that was in your group as well. Yeah. Um, so we were looking at some things with the primary tools and applications and approaches and just defining some of those for our group and evaluating the effects of fire. Um, so we were looking at um, just thinking about public acceptance of fire and impacts of smoke was a big one in wildlife management with questions that people had when they were prescribed fires, um, starting with small projects so that public could get used to smoke and then um, communicating and coordinating from a regional perspective and planning in hand when you have funding, um, looking at specific effects to wildlife because it's very dynamic. Some wildlife respond really well to fire and others like the Mexican spotted owl and the goshawk, um, are, it's more challenging um, for their management. Um, so uh, evaluating the effects of fire, 10 years post fire, looking at aspirin regeneration was a big one. And um, a lot of these were with low and moderate severe fire severity, um, you're looking at a lot of more foraging and top level predators in some of these habitats. Um, monitoring with wildlife cameras was a big one to just do counts and see the effects of vegetation and wildlife that we're using in those areas um, and even biomass you know, calculations. Um, looking at heterogeneity at landscape scales, there's many different ways to measure. So that's kind of complicated um, for this for this group, they're talking about the complexities of this one um, and the composite measures for pyrodiversity. So that was for number one. Um, Jamie, did I miss any for that one? Um, I add on that having large scale NEPA projects accomplished um, uh, allows more prescribed fire on the ground. I don't think I heard that as well. And some of these go into the challenges for the second question we were talking about. So um, just knowing when and where activities can happen so you have time to prepare was a big challenge because con conditions can change rapidly. Um, one example was just um, acoustic recorders being able to get those um, planning in hand. Um, so because of funding challenges and changes, they are different for individual forests. So if you change over and manage a different forest, there's going to be different funding available and different timings when you can get that funding and pre-plan for um, being able to use that funding for these type of projects. Um, uh, how dynamic systems um, are, like these systems are super dynamic, so just measuring them over time. Um, and having technical capacity, hiring technicians was one of the challenges or maybe shortcomings, um, hoping to hire more people who can work in the field. Um, grants and agreements, working for Keystone Species Grants, um, having someone in GA in the unit and at the regional level, and just the amount of time this takes to set up. So, you know, at the end of the year, like a huge chunk of time gets set up to plan for these grants and agreements to get them ready. Um, causal effects uh, within partner agreements and deliverables to help decisions. So uh, wildlife needs depending on vegetation type and fire history. 
And we had less time for um, question three. Um, so some of the things we were talking about is developing a program for acoustic monitoring. Uh, Sarah was, I think, uh, one of our folks who brought that up um, and how variable wildlife responses are uh, depending on fire and severity. And then uh, going back to the Mexican spotted owl having a checklist for thinning and burning um, and looking at larger habitat range to pre-plan for loss of any local species. Great. Yeah. I'm over here typing away. So thank you. Uh, anyone else want to add to that that was in that group on those three questions? Feel free. Okay, group G, who is that? Hey, Andy, that was me and Jenny. So I'll report out for us and anyone from my group, please feel free to join in. Um, I think we hit on several similar themes to the previous group um, when we we were pretty wildlife heavy, wildlife and kind of education focused in our group. So we didn't have any fire managers. So um, it's mostly from the wildlife perspective. Um, and so for that, in terms of tools and approaches that are working well and using, it's really for the species that we have good wildlife habitat data and survey data and keeping that information up to date so that it's available for prescribed fires and for responding to wildfires. Early coordination, especially with Fish and Wildlife Service and across agencies. So um, we talked a lot about Mexican spotted owl as well, but also Arizona hedgehog cactus and a couple examples from California, like Fisher and California spotted owl. Um, in that discussing about good things, we did, however, talk about some examples where the planning and coordination doesn't always happen. So like communication is good in some places, but there is a lot of variety. So I think it's still a challenge in some places for biologists to get pulled in when needed to talk directly about um, wildlife habitat, typically right before the burn. So in that implementation phase, less the planning phase, but more during implementation, some communication challenges. Um, and then in terms of some tools and applications, we wish we had um, continuing that theme of sharing across agencies. We wish there were better ways to share across agencies like craft a dashboard for um, being able to share data and coordinate um, some streamlining that could come from that early on. Um, and also like some species we have a ton of data for like Mexican spotted owl, but a lot of others. Um, again, we talked about Arizona hedgehog cactus specifically, don't necessarily have the specific data available. So um, need to spend some time focused on some of those less um, maybe obvious species sometimes. And then in terms of um, ways that we've evaluated effects of past fires on wildlife and habitat, I think um, Erica mentioned several that we kind of talked about direct monitoring um, in many cases. Um, sometimes doing simple, quick evaluations of burn severity using ravage data afterwards for kind of quick and dirty things. Um, and then also we did talk about like the value of um, still the rigorous scientific studies and that we've talked a lot yesterday, I think about how there's a lot of information out there and that we need to be sure to use it. And we all agree with that, um, but we also want to make sure that we're still creating new information. And then we talked a little bit about um, how best to share that information in different platforms and ways to think about kind of telling our story, I believe, as Shala said so nicely yesterday. I think that's sort of our quick and dirty summary. Anyone, Jenny or anyone else, want to add anything major I missed? Nope, I think you got it. Sounded great. Thanks, Becky. Great. Sure. And much of this, obviously, Becky and others will lead right into our next um, discussion, which is about communication and, and how to how to be better across agencies. So we want you to keep drilling in on that. So thank you. Um, group H, who's that? That is me and Aaron. Um, so we talked a bit um, about prescribed fire, um, which I assume most people did. But um, we also talked about seed banks and seeding. Um, especially post harvest to um, establish plants early that wildlife use and to protect against invasives. Um, our group right now doesn't have too much going on monitoring wise, but there are projects um, in progress or are being envisioned. Um, something I thought was impressive was that uh, one of the habitat restoration projects that went on for about 12 years, um, they went from about a handful of native flora to 21 native flora in five years. Um, and yeah, people talked about surveys and 
getting da uh, data in the wolf disk and that GIS uh, layers help, but there really needs to be kind of objectives and other things included and all of that in kind of summarized into uh, there's a lot of time needed, but not a lot of people. <laughs> um, there's capacity is lacking, um, which is a lot due to funding. Um, so it's hard to really get um, workers that can go out and do field surveys or can spend that extra time on the GIS uh, maps and um, also even just for these projects, long-term long projects, just funding dries up at some point. Um, and some of the team or group talked about um, being aware of the differences in prescribed fire and fuels management uh, based on what wildlife species are around. Um, one of the folks talked about that breeding season it tends to be the best time to do that, but also it's breeding season. So we need to be careful uh, to make sure uh, breeding is not impacted. Um, and the differences in elevation where uh, certain types of management might not be good in valleys, but better in higher elevations. Um, and using things uh, that are a bit simpler technology like trail cams, audio to observe fauna, um, especially their movements and activities post fire. And when we talked about um, tools we wish we had, um, a big part was communication amongst experts, agencies, all of that. Um, and also with the communication coordination, so actually acting on the communication um, and trying to work on a, instead of a all or nothing approach when it comes to, oh, we can't burn here because of this species. Um, we So we're just not gonna do it at all, um, kind of figure out what is needed um, and can be done. And a big, um, impact on plans and uh, burns and whatnot is political and social concerns around wildlife and the restrictions and struggles that come along with like the ESA, so the Endangered Species Act, and other things make, can make it hard to actually implement actions. Um, and folks talked about how post-implementation survey sample sizes are just so small um, again, capacity, there's not really a lot of people to go out there that it's hard to even come to conclusions. Um, and yeah, the, I think the main thing was communication and collabor collaboration across jurisdictions is something that really needs to improve. Great. Thanks, Callum. Uh, we have two more groups. So if we can just add to what others have uh, mentioned, that would be great. Group I, who was that? That was uh, Lauren and I. Um, I'll stick to the highlights. Um, you know, we talked a lot about how partnerships um, can help move fire management forward. Um, specifically, the Forest Service has keystone agreements um, with, with um, partners like Trout Unlimited, National Turkey, National Wildlife Turkey Federation, the Mule Deal Foundation, um, the Nature Conservancy, and those um, can really be taxa specific or, you know, they're specific to wildlife and the broader need for um, restoration and um, fire and wildlife systems at work. Um, let's see, um, you know, some bill money's been um, put towards that and that helps get funding to get these projects actually done on the ground. Um, some actually work with uh, Ducks Unlimited, like the Fish and Wildlife Service um, and other stakeholders. Um, and NGOs to leverage work and funding. And so that's been a good um, way to move things forward. Um, we did talk about, um, I'm looking for it, where private landowners um, need to be engaged so they can actually get work done on the ground or um, facilitate when a fire moves through that they can actually um, get 
use it for ben resource benefit as well. Um, so partnerships need to support each other and um, include private landholders. Um, some areas needed more monitoring tools um, post fire, which don't uh, may or may not exist, and ways uh, platforms of data sharing that would be um, helpful, um, and also more interdisciplinary communication. Great. Thanks, Idol. And last but not least, Group J. Who's that? That's me. <laughs> okay. Go so, ahead, Charlotte. Hey, did you you reported out yesterday too, didn't you? You're no. So lucky. I, oh, you didn't. Okay. I don't think so. <laughs> okay. So I guess just adding um, to, we, yeah, came to similar conclusions, but our group was mostly a uh, fish and wildlife service or uh, perspective. Um, we had some good, I guess, success stories or things that are going to need to happen as far as agency collaboration, um, some case studies talking about um, hares and snowpack in Idaho and, um, or I guess hare and lynx habitat and how there have been some collaborations to keep more snow on the ground in some parts of the forest so that the hares aren't mismatched basically where you have like white hairs on the brown ground. That makes them a lot easier to find for those links. Um, and then we also were talking about pinion jays here in juniper woodlands versus grasslands um, in the Kaibab and Prescott National Forests. Um, so some complexities of managing a landscape mosaic across agencies there. Um, uh, we also touched on keeping data up to date and managing data in one place across agencies well and how that would be beneficial um, and some communication challenges during the implementation of phase of prescribed burns as well. Um, and then, yeah, we also were talking about how there isn't a lot of monitoring or research done after fire activity as well. There's a lot sort of done on the front end, but not as much people going back afterwards to see um, what wildlife species actually return or um, sort of, yeah, that was a, a gap in um, information that we identified as well. So yeah, if anyone else from my group has anything else to add, feel free, but I think that's all we got. Great. All right. Thank you, everybody. Um, we're going to take a five minute break. And when we come back, Jessica will launch everyone back into breakout rooms. This next one, I'll just go ahead and give the um, what it is right now. It's going to be about integration and communication. So everything leading up to this, the three questions all kind of blend together. So there's nothing magical about having to address one, two, and three. I think it will be just a little bit shorter because we are running behind on time just a, a minute. Um, but we really want you to dive deep on this question, right? And to feel as comfortable as you can in terms of sharing how workplace culture influences communication, what kinds of training might be needed, um, because we'd love to be able to explore some of that as we move forward with this group. Communication with this group, as well as every other thing we work on, is and you all work on, seems to be very key. So enjoy your five minutes, and then we'll come back and launch into those groups. It's 1024, so come back at 1029, and please turn off your video and mute your microphone. Thank you.